coveted uh, final speaker slot in the conference when everybody is uh, speaking of reservation dogs and conferences. Everybody's uh, eager to uh, uh, get underway. But, uh, those of you who stuck around, be witch, Ani, Uju, Minogisha, Nibanami Kanabo Mose, and Vishnu Pass, Mangan Dodem, Minoshikani, and Gunjaba, and Mishnabe. My name is Waxmani Pass. I come from the place of the pike for the Bay Mills Indian community, which, if you go way up north and then keep going, and then you go a little bit more, you come to the Bay Mills Indian community at the very top of Michigan on the uh, Canadian border. And to paraphrase a famous quote, you can actually see Canada from my house. <laughs> um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here today to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the Department of the Interior. I first want to congratulate my colleague and, and uh, my new colleague, uh, uh, Rosalind So at the Indian Health Service and uh, her confirmation. And I want to congratulate NIHB on, on 50 years. That's pretty awesome. So congratulations to everybody here who uh, sustained this kind of energy for half a century. I can barely make it uh, through a day so uh, without needing 10 cups of coffee. Uh, but appreciate the work that NIHB does. Um, before I took this job, I served as tribal president. Um, and uh, that was uh, still, even, even two years into this job, probably the most rewarding work that I did in my uh, career in my life. And I was really inspired to do that by my mom, who I, I, I know you know, Kathy. Um, uh, she was our tribal health director for a period of time. And uh, she was 18 years old when she had me and uh, worked and went to college while raising me and worked in tribal health. And so I was raised around tribal health and I had an appreciation for tribal health uh, organizations uh, going into my role as uh, chairman. And little did I know <clears throat> how uh, closely involved I would be in tribal health because I was serving uh, during the pandemic um, and at the start of the pandemic. And I'm so thankful that we're all here in person, but it's, it's easy to forget now, it seems, how scary those first days were. Um, we didn't know what we were facing. We had no tools, we were flying blind, and we were relying on our own uh, indigenous ingenuity um, to keep our people safe. And we lost a lot of people across Indian country. Um, and it was, a real challenge on tribal leaders, and it was a, a, even more of a challenge for the tribal health professionals and those of you doing that work. Because you had to deal with the sickness in your own households and your families and keeping yourself safe while caring for your people, our communities. And I know, because I was there too, what you all went through in doing that work. And so on behalf of me, as a, just as a regular old guy from the res, I want to thank you for the work that you did to keep people in your communities and your families safe. And whether anybody tells you or not, whether you believe it, you saved people's lives. You saved people's lives. They, the people who are alive today because of your work will never know it was you, but we know it was you. And I'm so grateful for the work that Everybody in this room did. Everybody in tribal health, everybody in tribal leadership. Um, it was a real lesson in uh, the spirit of what Indian country is about. And I think we saw as the pandemic went on that Indian country became a leader, really, for the United States in how to come together and respond to a public health crisis. And when you look at these rural communities and you see, you see these bubbles on those maps of high vaccination rates uh, and declining infection rates, you'd, be, you'd, you'd see these little bubbles all across rural America. And those of us in this room know, you wouldn't even have to look beyond that. We would know that there was a tribal community there. And that uh, many tribes were protecting not only their own people, but their neighboring communities and became leaders. And that's a real testament to the professionalism uh, and the, the caring nature 
of indigenous people, and it's what gives me hope and heartens me for the next 50 years, because we know that's gonna be there as we get more rising health professionals. And so I wanna thank you for that and acknowledge all of your experience during that time as we gather here today. Uh, we know that uh, social determinants of health in Indian country have also been impacted by the harmful policies of the past, including colonization, the taking of Indian lands, and the forced assimilation of tribal communities. And our challenge is to heal from that, and our obligation on the, in the federal government is to build back what we, the federal government, worked so hard to destroy. With everything uh, that we do at Indian Affairs, our goal is to make sure that people have the opportunity to live safe, healthy, and fulfilling lives in their tribal communities. And that's the hallmark of our tribal way of life. And it's our policy goal here at the Department of the Interior under President Biden and Secretary Holland's leadership. So I've had the chance to travel all over Indian country during my time in this job. It's one of my most favorite parts of this job. And I've had the chance to uh, hear from tribal leaders in your communities about the things that we need to address. And there's certainly no shortage of challenges. We know that climate change is jeopardizing treaty rights, subsistence rights, water rights, the ability to grow and harvest our traditional foods. We have to repair and modernize our infrastructure in our communities. Uh, there's a need to improve public safety in tribal communities. And of course, as uh, was just mentioned we, um, in the previous panel, we have to restore and protect our tribal homelands. Just yesterday, the Department of the Interior announced that uh, we're creating indigenous food hubs for up to four BIE-operated schools and four BIA-operated detention centers to help source indigenous foods, enhance culturally-based nutrition education, and to boost training for healthy and culturally appropriate food preparation. For the first time, a nutritionist will be hired to support the BIE and the BIA in developing and implementing culturally appropriate nutrition standards that draw from indigenous knowledge. Special efforts are going to be made to identify and connect native vendors and producers as well as community-based systems such as tribal food sovereignty and health programs. This initiative is going to utilize indigenous knowledge to develop holistic approaches to support food sovereignty movements, incorporating culture, social determinants of health, and regenerative agriculture. And this initiative will include pilot hubs, as I mentioned, at four BIA schools and four BIA jails uh, to source foods from native producers and provide trainings for our cooks. We know that American Indian and Alaska Native populations face difficult physical and emotional health situations and low life expectancies, again, as was just mentioned in the previous panel. Many of these problems are directly related to diet, and food is an integral part of our cultures as indigenous people and our ceremonies. Food is medicine, and this is at the heart of our Food Hubs initiative, and that's why we're taking this up. In addition to that, as I mentioned, climate change is a big threat. We saw this just last week in Alaska um, with the storms in western Alaska <coughs> devastating dozens of native communities. Uh, we're seeing it now as, as we sit here, uh, the hurricane making landfall in Florida. Uh, these historic storms, they're getting bigger and stronger and they're posing a challenge to tribal communities everywhere. Um, because of where we live as Native people, because of our way of life connecting us to our homelands, we often feel the impacts of climate change first. And we often feel those impacts worst. Um, and so we have to respond to that threat and respond to that challenge in order to protect lives, livelihoods, and a way of life for Native people across the country. Toward that end, We've worked through President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law and the recently enacted Inflation Reduction Act 
to secure $436 million for investment in tribal communities. This is not funding that tribes are eligible to compete for. $436 million are going into tribal communities for climate resilience, adaptation, and relocation. Last September, we awarded more than $13 million to dozens of organizations and tribes to assist in their planning. And we're working to finalize our plans for a larger and more focused investment of those funds in tribal communities to respond to the threats of climate change. One of the biggest things that we've done in this administration to advance federal policy is the work that we've undertaken to restore tribal homelands, reform our land and the trust regulations, and partner with other federal agencies on co-management and co-stewardship so that the public lands in this country, which are Indian lands in Indian country, are uh, able to be managed and co-managed uh, by tribal nations. With our indigenous knowledge, we know that ma uh, landscape management and co-management can help heal our homelands, bring our original foods back, and make us healthier people. I always feel like the infomercial guy when I'm talking about all the stuff that we're doing because I just say, wait, there's one more thing. I know it's late in the day, but I want to talk about the infrastructure law, uh, as I mentioned, which on top of our which had $32 billion with a B for Indian country, the bipartisan infrastructure law puts another $13 billion into Indian country, uh, including $466 million at the BIA. Earlier this year, we announced the first $50 million in funding for that, including upgrades to our BIA-owned water systems. We also announced 50 million, or excuse me, $10 million in funding for BIA <coughs> irrigation projects, like the Waterfield <coughs> Irrigation Project at Yakima, which supports, by the way, half a billion dollars a year worth of agricultural products into our economy. We were, I also got to visit Pine Ridge, and, uh, where we announced a $29 million investment in dam reconstruction. Um, and that's just the start of this work that we're doing. We also have the Tiwahe Initiative, uh, which includes our pilot programs. Uh, our 23 budget request in, includes an increase of $20.2 million above the enacted FY22 funding levels to increase the number of sites number of tribes participating in this initiative. Um, we also have seen in the report we submitted to Congress that the Tiwahe Initiative has been an overwhelming success in helping tribes keep families together. And we're really proud of the work that our participating tribes have done uh, under this program and we're excited to have the opportunity to grow it. So all these things that I just talked about, you know, I'm the Fed up here listing off all this stuff, uh, but we know they're all connected. Our lands and waters are directly connected to our health. Economic opportunity is directly related to our ability to acquire and protect our homelands. Quality infrastructure ensures we have clean water to drink and clean air to breathe. And I want to mention when we talk about clean air, we don't just mean the air outside. We also need to talk about the air inside our homes, our schools, our tribal buildings, because that's environmental justice too. And that's an important part of what we're working on. This is all connected. Adequate and professional policing ensures our communities are safe so that we can lead those fulfilling lives. All these connected things ensure that Native people have the opportunity to lead those safe and healthy and fulfilling lives in our communities. And we're working across all those fronts. But I want to close by talking about one final thing. A uh, few things <coughs> are as essential to ensure the continuation of our way of life as protecting our families and our kids, including the kids who were forcibly taken from tribal communities in the past, as well as the children who are yet to come. That's why Secretary Holland has undertaken this important work of reviewing the United States policy of forced assimilation through the federal Indian boarding school system. This is the first time in the history of 
of the United States that the federal government has done anything like this. This system of boarding schools has had a lasting impact on Native people and tribes across the country, and it continues to impact us to this day. From the breakup of our families, to the destruction and erasure of tribal languages and cultural practices, this boarding school system has left deep and lasting scars. And there's not a single one of us in Indian country, not a single person, whether they know it or not, who hasn't been affected by these boarding schools. And after a year of research and review, we were able to release volume one of the Federal Indian Boarding School Report back in May. Really proud of this project and the work that went into this. Um, our team did a lot. And our team at the Department of the Interior that did this work, that put this report together, most of them are native themselves. So not only was this a historic task, and not only was it a labor of love, but it was a taxing labor of love. For our staff, we had to read trauma after trauma after trauma, and then call through it and organize it and tell the story in a way that will resonate, not just with Indian country, but with the American people. And I'm really proud of the work that our team did on this, and I hope that you are too. <coughs> Our report confirms that the Federal Indian Boarding School was part of a twin U.S. policy, the dispossession of Indian lands and the forced assimilation of Indian kids. They were connected, they were intentional, and the report lays that out. It also details a number of investigative findings about the conditions of these schools, how they were funded, and for the first time it publishes an official list of the Federal Indian Boarding Schools. While this initiative looks to the past for answers, our work is also laying the foundation to protect Indian kids into the future. The documented and purposeful federal action to erase native languages through boarding schools confirms that today we need to invest in native language revitalization more than ever yes. to ensure their survival. And the documented experiences of survivors in Indian boarding schools and their descendants uh, affirms the need to strengthen health care delivery for American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians as part of treaty rights and our federal trust obligation. And I want to thank NIHB and all of you for advocating for them. The report also demonstrates that we need to remain vigilant at preventing the forced removal of Indian children from their tribes and their families. Even today, we see that there's no shortage of people who are eager to come into tribal communities and tell Indian families and Indian people what's best for Indian kids. There's no shortage of people who are eager to return to a policy of adoption and removal. We can never allow forced removal of Indian children to happen again, ever. And that's why this administration and this department are working alongside all of you to defend the Indian Child Welfare Act and to protect the integrity of child welfare systems across Indian country. Our work isn't done, and we're working to develop the next volume of our boarding school initiative report, which will include more information about the number of burial sites, the number of kids uh, who went through the Federal Indian Boarding School system, trying to identify their names and tribal affiliations and age, and also trying to identify how much money the United States federal government spent on this boarding school system from beginning to end. We also want to work to identify religious institutions and other non-federal entities that ever received federal funding in support of this boarding school system. Secretary Holland and I have uh, been out on the road together as part of her Road to Healing tour um, to hear from survivors uh, of these boarding schools um, and to help connect communities with trauma-informed support and, and put together an oral history of everybody's experience at these schools, those who are still living, and not only the, the people who went to these schools, but their families, because I think everybody here understands 
that the impacts of these boarding schools, <coughs> they, they resonate. It affects your ability to be a, a, a spouse or a brother or a sister or a parent. And that in turn affects your, it affects your family. And so we've worked to try to build an oral history of that. Uh, and we've held two of these listening sessions so far in Oklahoma and in Michigan where we've heard from hundreds. We heard from dozens, but they were attended by hundreds of uh, boarding school survivors and their, their relatives. And these have been very um, emotional and taxing events. Um, but it, it's necessary. And it, it wouldn't have been possible without Secretary Holland's leadership and also the President's. This administration is, is committed to getting this story told and to, to being honest about the Federal Indian Boarding School system and its impact on Indian people and also charting a path forward that brings healing and that benefits Indian people and Indian communities. So I talked for a long time. I want to thank you guys for uh, sticking through that. I, I only covered a few of the things that we're doing. Um, we've been really busy. When I started this job, I had more hair. Um, so I've already warned my wife that uh, I'll probably be bald by the time I'm done with this job. Um, but it's been, it's been fun and rewarding uh, to be a part of this. Um, I've really enjoyed it, and I, uh, the thing I enjoy most of all is working alongside of people across Indian country. And I've been grateful to get calls and texts and of support and, and people reaching out, um, checking in, and um, also I just appreciate the partnership uh, because that's how it's supposed to work. It's not supposed to be feds up here bossing Indians around as, they, as the saying is to, to go. It's supposed to be collaborative. And I've really enjoyed it and appreciated it, and I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for everything that you do and for allowing me to be a part of it with you. Miigwech. Thank you.